is uh, Gabe Ben Musa. I'm the Deputy Chief of Training EMS for City of Salem. I want to welcome you. Uh, if you're from Oregon, welcome to Salem. If you're from outside of Oregon, welcome to Oregon and Salem. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, DPSST for providing the facilities and uh, uh, some of the Woodburn Ambulance, uh, giving us a couple mannequins, and also Zoll for sponsoring the event. Um, I'd like to thank Chief Niblock. Um, he's very supportive of this symposium. And with that, I'll introduce uh, Jeff Roberts with Zoll. Good morning, everybody. I'm not going to take a whole lot of time, but I want to, uh, like Chief Ben Musa here, uh, say thanks for taking the time to attend this event. We're honored to be able to sponsor it. Uh, Zoll has a strong commitment to the clinical side of, uh, of what you do, and it's great just by the fact that you're here demonstrating that you guys are committed to that aspect as well. So um, I'll take a quick minute just to say thanks to our you know, presenters uh, that we'll be presenting over the next couple days. Uh, Dr. Lenfield from the State Medical Director's Office, um, the folks from Rialto, um, from Las Vegas Fire, and then also from Gig Harbor. So really appreciate you taking the time to be here. Um, I'm the Vice President of our US EMS sales team, so hopefully at some point I'll get out to all of your facilities, but uh, again, appreciate your time. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to the doc. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, like the slide says, I'm Dave Lairfeld. I'm the uh, State EMS Medical Director um, from the government here to help. Um, been doing this job about five years now. It's, uh, it's quite a, a learning curve to come from, uh, from jumping calls uh, in the middle of the night to, uh, to dealing with the legislators and the county commissioners and things like this. But uh, hopefully you're seeing some progress at the State EMS office. We're trying to trying to make life uh, easy for you, or easier for you. It'll never be easy. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about out of hospital cardiac arrest today. And I really only wanna talk about two things. Um, I wanna go over our national and local cares data, um, really about the basics of cardiac arrest and, and hopefully demonstrate where the data says we should be concentrating our basic efforts. Um, but that's usually pretty boring, but I have to do it because I, I love data. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the more advanced stuff that's happened in the second half of the talk over the past uh, 12 months. So this is what we got, right? At a hospital cardiac arrest. We got, um, we got our dead guy here. Um, we got Roy over here who's not doing CPR, but he's got a cool stethoscope. Um, Got a monitor defibrillator. Uh, some of you may remember the days when uh, those were um, two separate things. Like I think the Life Pack 5 was the first one where the monitor, they were actually separate. They just put a, a hinge on them so you could carry them as one thing. Um, yeah, so, and I think you've got a drug box maybe, airway, something like that. Um, yeah, there's our drug box. And if you're really gangsta, uh, like Johnny and Roy here, you bring a shoddy to the party because you just never know when something's going to pop off. Uh, those were the good old days, right? Manual, manual paddles and a security guard. Uh, all right, so at a hospital cardiac arrest, about 356,000 people in the United States every year. That's not all the dead people, right? The 911 gets called on. That's all the people that somebody tries to resuscitate. So that's how we're defining that. Uh, the amount of dead people, who knows. Um, of course, it's 100% uh, mortality when untreated, right? This is the definition of dead, uh, to have cardiac arrest. Uh, although that's evolving, and right at the end of the talk, I want to loop back to that again. Treated nationally, about a 90% mortality rate, okay? So it's still uh, the highest mortality out of any condition we treat. In Oregon, we're doing a little bit better. Our overall mortality for somebody who has resuscitation attempted on them is 85%, not 90. So we're doing better than the national average. There's a huge regional variation on this. Um, if you're looking at not agencies, not states, but counties, um, between 3.4 and 22% survival, right? Uh, so what does this tell us? It tells us that the things we do matter, right? Because if none of the stuff, if CPR didn't work, if defibrillation didn't work, if epinephrine, all, if all the things we do didn't work, 
then there'd be no variation, right? Because none of the stuff we were doing really mattered that much. So the huge variation tells us that the things we do matter. There we go. Okay. So the American Heart Association has their chain of survival. Um, I'm sure everybody's familiar with it. Uh, people bitch about paying for their cards because they're expensive, but they do take our money and they do good work with it. Um, most of what we know about cardiac arrest, the science uh, is promulgated out to the public this way. Um, let's look at where the data shows our largest return of investment is. Um, so I want to concentrate on this part right here. So this is EMS and first responder response times. And it's kind of a busy picture, but what I want to point out to you is this, right? It's right at the eight minute mark that EMS starts showing up at the same time responders do, all right? So before eight minutes, it's their game. And then after eight minutes, it's our game. And this isn't an accident, right? We've built our systems this way all over the United States for the past 30 years based on these eight minute response times, right? Our ASAs are built on this. Our yearly budgets are built on this. Our, the amount of engines and ambulances we have, our, our work shifts are all built on this eight minute response time. And it takes an enormous um, amount of effort to change this. I, uh, I made the mistake my second year on the job of going over all the scientific literature for response times and trauma. And I presented it to the uh, state EMS board and with the suggestion that maybe our consensus-based targets for response times uh, needed to be revisited. And I, I almost got lynched. Um, and, and I came to realize that's because uh, everybody's livelihood, everybody's structure, everybody's department, everybody's budget is built off of this eight minute response time for cardiac arrest. So we're not gonna change that anytime soon. Uh, but given that in statistical models, you have a 10% increase in mortality per minute during cardiac arrest, well, if we're not there for the first eight minutes, what are we gonna do about that? I mean, how much impact can we have if we're not there for the first eight minutes? So, early CPR. Early CPR, we know, improves survival. Sorry, my uh, clicker isn't clicking. All right, so this is National CARES data. Um, this is response time versus survival. I want to point out a couple of things. The first thing I want to point out is this line. So that's zero or zero to three in eight minutes, and you can see the de decrease in survival. Um, I also want to point out that is uh, V-fib arrest, the red line. And this is all, um, sorry, uh, unwitnessed. So this, uh, the red line is uh, bystander CPR with witnessed. The green line is unwitnessed. So response times don't seem to matter with unwitnessed arrest, right? The mortality increases slightly, but not much compared to the uh, witnessed with bystander. And the top line is witnessed V-fib. Um, so I don't know if we'll ever get to the point where we're not going to respond code three to a cardiac arrest, um, but there only seems to be benefit in a certain subgroup. Now, if you look at this, this is bystander CPR. Compared to the same patients in the subgroup we looked at last time um, at the zero and eight minute mark, we have decreased mortality. You see the 23 to 15% in the last one, and in this one, we're at 30 to 20%. So which group do you wanna be in, right? So remember, this is in the period of time before we get there. This is in the period of time before EMS gets there. So your change in mortality here is from your bystanders. 
Let's look at overall survival. The relationship holds true regardless of time. If you got bystander CPR in the field, you're more likely to achieve ROSC. You're more likely to be alive, to be admitted to the hospital, and you're more likely to live. So 7.5 to 13, that's almost doubling in survival, right? That's a 90% increase in survival just when controlling for everything else, just because you got bystander CPR and we know in the first eight minutes, it's not gonna be us. All right, what are we doing about it? Well, two years ago, uh, the Oregon Health Authority partnered with the American Heart Association, introduced Senate Bill 79. Um, it requires every student in the state of Oregon, grades seven through 12, to be taught hands-on CPR, not a slideshow. It's gotta be hands-on CPR and hands-on AED use, and it's gotta be ta taught to a national standard. American Heart Association, American Red Cross. Um, so we got off the naughty list um, and joined uh, these uh, communist states where the government makes people do things such as Texas, Utah, Idaho. Uh, so we're finally on the map. We have a law that all our kids are going to be taught how to do CPR and use an AED. It's gonna take years uh, for that to, to show up in our cardiac arrest survival rates. Um, but we're on our way there. So how are we doing? So this is Oregon versus national for who initiated CPR. Um, and you can see we're actually doing pretty good. 11% uh, better than the, our national CARES cohort at bystander CPR. However, um, we also have a 6% higher witness rate. So think about that. More people are getting bystander CPR, but more people are having cardiac arrests in front of somebody else. And where the relationship between that 6% um, of people, in increased witnesses and 11% increased CPR, I'm not exactly sure where that is in Oregon. There is a relationship. We haven't done the math to figure out exactly how because there's also got to factor in location of arrest as well. But if you look at national data, um, so not everybody that has a witnessed cardiac arrest is going to get bystander CPR. And not everybody who has an unwitnessed uh, cardiac arrest is not going to get bystander CPR. But there does seem to be a strong relationship with it. Um, if you look at the witnessed, 43% of them got bystander, or 46% of them got bystander CPR versus the unwitnessed 31%. So there is a mathematical relationship there. What it is in Oregon, we're not sure. Um, so part of that 11% is probably due to this. Regardless, we still have uh, um, a higher bystander rate than the national, but it's still pretty low overall. Um, bottom line, there's Big bang for your buck in bystander CPR. Uh, almost a doubling of survival just off of that one intervention alone. Um, Senate Bill 79 is gonna take years, maybe even a decade to show up in our bystander survival rates. So really, you know, how are we gonna use this information locally to in increase our bystander CPR rates is the question we have now. Uh, what I haven't mentioned here is dispatcher CPR. Um, what do you think provides a higher mortality benefit? Bystander CPR or dispatcher CPR? Bystander. Right, bystander CPR by about 6%. And that data is from 2001, but I don't know any data to contradict that. Um, you can theorize why. You know, somebody who initiates CPR on their own without being told probably already knows how to do CPR. Uh, they're probably more invested in it. They probably got it going before they called 911. Uh, there's all sorts of theories, but definitely. You want to do both, um, but if you only have the resources to do one, educating the public's probably the best bang for your buck. All right, rapid defibrillation. Now, we're still here talking about the public here, the lay people, right? We know we can do all this stuff. We're looking at survival again. Bystanders versus first responder versus uh, EMS. 
and this is, regard, this is not looking at time. This is just looking at who did it. There is a relationship with time, but it's not a linear relationship. Um, so again, if you got defibrillated by a bystander, your survival is almost twice of that if you got defibrillated by EMS. Um, not a lot of things we do is gonna double your survival, right? You double your survival with bystander CPR. You double your survival with bystander defibrillation. What does giving lidocaine get you for your survival? We're going to go over that in a minute, but you're not doubling your survival. All right. So still pretty low. 18% of our out-of-hospital cardiac arrests occur in a public location where you could be witnessed. Um, only about 29% of those people get defibrillated, despite the millions and millions of dollars we've invested in um, public access AEDs. So let's look at Oregon. Who applied the AED? Uh, was the AED applied prior to uh, EMS arrival? Um, below national average, 20% more out of hospital cardiac arrests occur in public locations in Oregon. Uh, but we only had, we're about, so more, more than national, right? 18% national, 20% in Oregon occur in public locations, but we're about 10% less on AED use. I'm not sure why that is. Um, more public arrest, less AED use. I don't know, do we need more AEDs? Uh, I don't know how many AEDs we have in the state of Oregon and where they are. Um, I just know they aren't being put on before EMS gets there as much as the national average. And I do know it enhances survival. Um, so who's putting the AEDs on? So it looks like, now remember, more public arrests, less overall AED use, but higher bystander AED use. Now, how do you reconcile those three pieces of information, right? Bystanders are using them more than first responders. So do our first responders not have AEDs? Are we not defining our first responders in the right way? Should we be putting our AEDs in schools and shopping malls, or should we be putting them on mobile assets that are connected by radio to a dispatch center? So law enforcement, sanitation, ODOT, right? All of these things are mobile. All of them have radios. All of them are connected to dispatch centers and can be sent to cardiac arrests. What is it about our first responders in Oregon that they're not deploying their AEDs? I just know the numbers at the end. I don't know the cause of this. But those are the questions I would ask. All right, last, last few things I want to say about BLS. Um, this is national data from CARES about survival from agencies that have greater than 150 cases per year. All right, so if these numbers don't jive with overall survival, it's because this is a subgroup. Um, but on the top, this is all comers, and you can see uh, survivals between 29, uh, 2.9 and 29, uh, 21%. So a seven-fold difference between the highest performing agency and the lowest performing agency. And if you see Utstein bystander on the bottom, uh, that's between 6.3 and 81%. Um, that's a 12-fold difference. So again, the things we do matter, right? You can have a 6% chance of living or an 81% chance of living depending on which EMS agency is treating you in your cardiac arrest. And I suspect that the agencies that have 81% survival, they're probably very selective. But let's face it, you know, it, you can learn to game the system, right? Um, there are risk profiles that will tell you who is more likely to respond to your therapy and not. But that aside, the agencies that have these very high survival rates probably concentrate on the basics. And unless they teleport themselves everywhere, the basics they're concentrating on is getting the public or first responders 
to do CPR and defibrillate their patients. That's what the data shows us, right? It's not, it's not when the paramedics show up, right? It's not when the ALS engine shows up. It's all the stuff that happens with the dispatcher and the lay public before you show up where you're probably making most of these gains. All right, so that's basic in Oregon. Uh, we're doing better than average. Um, you can see on all metrics, we're better than average. Uh, ROSC, survival to hospital discharge, uh, good to moderate, uh, cerebral perfusion categories. Um, but how we get there is probably through the lay public. It's probably through um, our first responders. And then when we show up, we get to play with these relatively uh, low yield toys we're gonna talk about next. All right, so here's us. We're finally here. Paramedics are on the scene and we're here to save the day. Um, so let's spend the second half of this talk talking about what's happened in the medical literature these past 12 months. So, this was actually two years ago. Um, it finished, uh, there's been variable uh, penetration of this study throughout our agencies. So amiodarone, lidocaine, or placebo for out of hospital cardiac arrest. This was like the third to the last, I believe, rock study. Um, done multi 10 sites throughout the United States. When this study uh, started, I was actually at the Dallas rock site and then in the middle of it moved here to the Portland rock site. Uh, finally finished. Have you guys heard of this, Alps? Show of hands. Who's heard of Alps? All right. All right, so put your money down. Who you got? Amiodarone, lidocaine, or placebo for, for shock resistant VFib arrest? Placebo. Placebo. You guys are down for placebo. Okay. That's a smart crew. Um, let's see if I can get my slides to work. So here we are amiodarone, lidocaine, or placebo. 24, 23, 21 with a p value of. Uh, 0.37, that just tells us if this is, if these numbers here, we're seeing them by chance or are they statistically significant, they're not. So it looks like doesn't matter, right? Doesn't matter, amiodarone, lidocaine, placebo, a lot of people try to predict this. However, as usual in these studies, that's not the whole story. When you look at the entire cohort, those are the numbers. But there was heterogeneity in the treatment effect, and there's a subgroup of these people, um, people that were not surprisingly bystander witnessed, right? These people were bystander witnessed, and we know that's a good thing. You want to have somebody see you die, and you want to have somebody do CPR on you. Um, and in that subgroup, these are the numbers, right? 27, 27, and 22 with a p-value of 0 0.04. We're looking for less than 0 0.05, so this made it statistically significant difference. Um, and you can just get a general grasp of that by the numbers, right? Oops. Amiodarone and lidocaine seem to perform pretty equally, much better than placebo. Um, so how do you actualize something like this, right? If you're a medical director, are you gonna write a protocol that says, when you guys are treating a cardiac arrest, you gotta find out if there was a witness and get a bystander CPR, and only then are you gonna give amiodarone or lidocaine. And you know, the practical thing, if, if this was me, it's just no, this stuff costs pennies. You know, if you have shock resistant V-fib arrest, just give the amiodarone and lidocaine. Um, you're not gonna hurt anybody, and you're gonna get a little bit of benefit out of it. Um, I did want to mention the, the uh, they also did an analysis during this study of side effects of all of these drugs, and yes, placebo, normazoline did have some side effects as well. The only one that reached uh, statistical significance was that amiodarone tended to cause more heart blocks and require more pacing. Um, probably a good trade-off, you know, if you were dead and now you're alive with a heart block and needing some pacing, I'll take that. Um, but it makes sense, right? Amiodarone is a sodium channel blocker. It's a calcium channel blocker. It's a potassium channel blocker. It's a beta blocker. So of course it's gonna induce, uh, uh, induce more heart blocks, but you have pacing pads, you can deal with heart blocks. What else happened this year? Anybody use these? Yeah, king tubes. I got a bunch of them in my closet. I don't know what I'm gonna do with them, but I guess if my neighbor's dog arrests, I can throw a king tube in them. Um, who uses these? I mean, this is defined, right? This is back in the day. This is, this is what made you a paramedic. The fact that you could stick ET tubes in people 
now that we have CPAP machines, we don't, we don't innovate anybody anymore, but all those CHFers, they all used to buy a tube, right? Because that'd be tripoding, uh, you know, satin like 80%, tripoding on the edge of their bed like this. They already have nebulizers going and all sorts of other stuff because nobody knows whether it's CHF or COPD or pneumonia. And then you put them on the stretcher and all that fluid from their legs goes into their lungs and you're halfway to the hospital and you got a tube or you're tubing them in the hospital parking lot. Um, we don't do it much anymore. Cardiac arrest is one of the few places we do it or for airway protection, head trauma, something like that. But uh, it's definitely a dying skill. Um, so King tubes versus ET tubes versus who does this for cardiac arrest? I think somebody mentioned it. Yeah. BVMs, this was big in Texas and Arizona for a while. Um, some don't even do anything. When we were in, uh, in Texas, we were doing absolutely just passive oxygenation for the first six minutes. Then you could, then you could do your techniques of choice. So three studies in 2018, uh, the PARC trial, which was the second and last uh, rock trial, and it was superglottic airway versus ET tube. Then there was the Airways 2 trial in England, and it was superglottic airway versus ET tube. And then there was BVM versus ET tube. Um, so the PARC trial, American trial, 3,000, it was a rock trial, uh, 3,000 uh, participants block randomization to either ET or superglottic airway. Um, and overall, they found the winner was, did you guys hear about this one? Let's guess, just shout it out, who won, ET tube? or superglottic airway for the PART trial? Somebody here knows. Superglottic, right. Superglottic won, 18% versus 15%. Superglottics win. Great, so now we know the answer. We know what to do in cardiac arrest. And then the airways trial was published in the exact same copy of the exact same journal in the exact same month. So you had both studies published in the same publication. Airways 2 was in England, uh, over 9,000. Right, so over triple the amount of. Um, slight different study, uh, block randomization again, but much smaller blocks. Um, and they found 6.4 versus 6.8, not statistically significant. Right, so you've got two publications in two different patient populations that appear to be similar. There are some differences um, that seem to tell you two different things. So what do you do? Well. Before we can even digest that, we have a third study that compares BVMs to endotracheal tubes. Uh, smaller, but still respectable, 2,000 uh, cardiac arrests. Um, by the way, this was looking at 72-hour survival. Um, the PART trial, uh, Airways 2, and the BVM trial were looking at 30-day uh, um, favorable neurological outcomes. So different patient populations, different outcomes, but they seem to all try to ask a similar question. What's the best airway strategy in cardiac arrest? Um, and uh, the, the BVM uh, versus ET tube, it was 4.3 and 4.2, no difference found. So how do we deal with this information? One study says these two are the same and another study says these two are the same. So does that mean that this is equivalent to this? I don't know. Um, I do wanna point out to you some interesting things about these studies. So in the PART trial, superglottic versus ET tube, in the, the, the first pass intubation rate was 51%, right? So only half of the people that tried to intubate actually made it on the first attempt. Um, in the Airways 2 trial, the first pass intubation rate was 69%, right? So almost 20% higher or one-fifth higher. Um, so that's gonna confound the results a little bit. Um, in the PARC trial, seventy-seven percent of the people in the intubation group eventually got intubated in the ED or somewhere else, um, which is much lower than the eighty-five percent of the superglottic airway group that actually got a superglottic airway. Right. So less people in the intubation group got intubated. Period, and more people in the superglottic airway group got it. And the, it also took longer or multiple attempts in that group. So that's going to throw a confounder in that intubation group and maybe make that intubation group look worse than it would have. Um, 
There were also some complications with both these devices. There was more aspiration with the supraglottic airway. That's sort of intuitive. There were more rib fractures and pneumothorax with the um, endotracheal tube, which is sort of intuitive as well, right? If you've got more positive pressure in the chest and you're doing CPR, you're going to probably have more injuries. None of this seems to have changed the mortality. Uh, what wasn't published in the PART study is that if you looked at all 10 sites, uh, the results showed that the supraglottic airway was superior. But there was, uh, and, and Henry didn't publish this in resuscitation, but there uh, are appendices that are not published that show you how each individual site performed. Well, there are some sites where their endotracheal innovation first pass rate was actually very high, and in those sites, the, the uh, endotracheal group actually had lower mortality. So take that for what it's worth. Um, I also wanted to point out that um, the less we intubate for other conditions, probably the less proficient we're going to be at it. Uh, so what's the right strategy here? Well. If I was to synthesize all three of these studies, I'd probably say that there's no wrong airway strategy for cardiac arrest, okay? If you look at the data from all three of these studies, none of them um, clearly says you should do this first and you should do this second. I would say that if you're going to use endotracheal innovation as your first attempt, make sure you're really good at it. You know, have hard data from your agency that shows your first pass. Uh, your first pass rate is, is relatively high, and that you have corresponding mortality data um, to show that that's the right strategy at your agency. There are so many confounders here. Are the agencies that have really good at intubating, are they really good at everything else they do, right? Are they really good at CPR? Are they really good at defibrillation? Um, there, there's a ton of confounders here, and we could speculate forever. But I think the take home for this for me um, is that there is no wrong strategy between these three at this point. How about this? Do you guys use this? For cardiac arrest, I mean, hopefully you're not using this for anaphylaxis. I had a case once where that happened and it, the next, next hour, actually the next 90 minutes before the guy went to the cath lab was, was pretty exciting. Uh, I, I have the EKGs from that if you want to see it um, after this talk. So. Who's given epinephrine for cardiac arrest? Everybody? Who's not, I should say? Who's not giving epinephrine? Okay. All right. So again, two studies in 2018. Um, the first one, uh, Local Boy Makes Goods. This is Matt Hansen. He's a PZR guy um, up at OHSU. Uh, so retrospective study. Don't boo for retrospective studies. They have their place. Uh, so he looked at the rock epistry. So this is every cardiac arrest patient put into every rock study over the past decade or more. So 32,000 patients, all right? That's a lot of patients. So he asked this question. Non-shockable rhythms. And he had a reason for looking at that. It simplifies it. In non-shockable patients, right, you only really have two things that you're doing. You're doing CPR and you're giving epinephrine. Right? So you don't have the defibrillation and you don't have the lidocaine and all this other stuff. Because he was trying to get at what the epinephrine does. Um, so in non-shockable patients, what is the time effect of epinephrine? Um, so he looked at this in two ways and he looked at a bunch of subgroups as well. Um, but he looked at every minute delay in getting epinephrine, what does that do to your mortality? And he found 4% decrease in odds of survival for every minute in delay in epinephrine. And then he dichotomized the patients into less than 10 minutes and more than 10 minutes to epinephrine. Um, and he found out that he found in, in these 32,000 non-shockable um, cases that if you got epinephrine after 10 minutes, first before 10 minutes, then you had an 18% increase in mortality. Well, that's kind of unexpected, right? Because, again, in the very same year, in the very same journal, we have 
the Paramedic 2 trial. All right, and again, it's a trial out of England, a very well done study, 8,000 patients, not 32,000, 8,000, but prospective randomized double blind study. All right, those are all the words we want to hear. And guess what they found when you randomized all comers, anybody EMS attempted resuscitation on and got epinephrine versus didn't get epinephrine, what was the mortality benefit? You guys probably already heard the answer to this, right? They found no benefit. So how are you going to reconcile those two things? We've got this rock cohort of non-shockable. It seems like, so if epinephrine doesn't make a difference overall, then why would it matter when you got it? Uh, seems to be conflicting data, two different patient populations. They're measuring two slightly different things. Um, it has been pointed out that um, the mean time to get epinephrine in the, uh, the uh, uh, paramedic two trial was 21 minutes. Um, a lot of people have pointed to this and say, well, of course it didn't work, you gave it too late. Uh, this is speculation, but if you look at Matt Hansen's data, there is an argument to be made there. He's saying if you give it early, it's better. Um, these guys are saying it doesn't matter at all, and then he says, well, yeah, that's because you guys gave it way too late. It would also be of note that um, if you exclude the people um, that got ROSC before epinephrine was given, uh, their survival rate uh, was about 2.8% in England. So what's our survival rate here in, in Oregon? 15% overall. So is this the same patient population? Are, are these equivalent patient populations? Um, it doesn't appear their patients are our patients or that their system is our system. How would I interpret this data? Um, first of all, don't have a cardiac arrest in England. That's my, uh, that's my interpretation. Um, should you give epi early? There's no right answer. I'm gonna say probably, if you're gonna give it, give it early. I know we're gonna get a, uh, a different view a little bit later today, um, but that's my synthesis of that data. All right, Dr. Lairfeld, what is this crazy stuff you're doing to pigs here? It's not me, I swear. It's that the crazy ITD guy again. Um, so what has he been doing? He's been putting pigs on tilt tables with ITD devices on their airway and uh, compression devices on them, and he's been measuring a few things over the past couple of years. So one of the things he measured was heart blood flow um, and brain blood flow. Um, the reason he did blood flow versus pressures, which uh, it's just easier to do. You can inject microspheres and, and measure flow easier than cannulizing brains. Um, so what he found was that you get better perfusion of the heart and brain if you elevate um, a pig's head. And theoretically, that's because you increase venous drainage, right? Uh, you let gravity do its work because our bodies are made physiologically to operate like this, not like this. Um, so the next year he went back and he actually went ahead and cannulated everything and showed uh, increased cerebral perfusion pressures and coronary perfusion pressures for heads up. Okay, so we've got better flow, we've got better pressures. Um, then he did something really interesting. So these are in I probably didn't say this, but uh, I, I probably should. These are pigs in V-fib arrest, right? So you intubate them, you cannulate them, put them in V-fib arrest, let them hang around in V-fib arrest for like six minutes, then you start doing CPR on them and you measure these pressures. Uh, so what does that mean in humans? Well, he did this really, actually, kind of clever study. Um, so he did the same thing that I'm describing here in a live pig in V-fib arrest. And then he took a dead pig, a pig cadaver, and he showed, and he did this, and he showed that the increases you see in a live pig, although not to the same extent, also occur proportionally in a dead pig. And then he got a dead human, and he showed that um, the increases in a dead human are proportional, not the same numbers, but are proportional to the dead pig and therefore proportional to the live pig therefore making the argument that if it works in a live pig, it'll work in a dead human, and therefore 
if it works in a live pig, it'll work in a dead pig. If it works in a dead pig and a dead human, therefore it should, by inference, work in a live human. Um, last study that's been done on this, this was published in 2018, said we're going to take it one step further. I've got 41 minutes. Okay, we're all right. Um, they said, all right, you've measured flow. You've measured cerebral perfusion pressure. We're going to actually measure brain tissue oxygenation. Um, and they basically did the same setup. They instrumented everything. Um, they also had devices for, for monitoring um, tissue uh, oxygen saturation. And all the numbers were the same, but the tissue oxygen saturation didn't move. Um, but they only achieved cerebral perfusion pressures around 11 uh, because they weren't, and, and this is uh, something to note. So the cerebral perfusion pressures in the, in the previous studies were 28, which is actually decent. 11, not enough to maintain life. Uh, and the authors uh, got in a little um, sort of Twitter war, and it was pointed out that the, uh, it was alleged that the, the reason um, this last study that measured tissue oxygenation uh, didn't show good tissue oxygenation and had such a low cerebral perfusion score or cerebral perfusion pressure was because they weren't using an ITD device and an active compression decompression device, which is how the first author came up uh, with his uh, high perfusion numbers. Um, so no randomized human trials as yet, but you'll hear some more uh, evidence about how this um, this was derived actually from uh, a lot of other patient cohorts, um, just not cardiac arrest ones. All right, so what else is new in 2018? So this is the AHA's uh, focused update. What does the AHA say? They say amiodarone and lidocaine may be considered for ventricular, uh, for VFib, pulseless VTAC. Well, that came out of the ALP study. We just went over that, right? Uh, what else do they say? They say don't use magnesium, not recommended. Uh, may consider in torsades. Uh, there were four trials uh, about using magnesium and VFib arrest. Uh, none of them showed any mortality benefit. They were all kind of underpowered. Um, and it should be pointed out, what is the mech, well I should ask so we can point it out. What is the mechanism for, or what is the theory for using magnesium in, in polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, right? So it shortens the QT. If you're ever in the hospital, if you get to do an ED rotation, find a patient whose EKG shows a long QT and try to t talk the doc into giving him a two gram bolus of magnesium. This works on anybody, right? Not just QT prolonging, it it'd work on me. Like if you gave me a big bolus of magnesium, it'd shorten my QT, even if it wasn't abnormally long. So giving magnesium shortens your QT temporarily. Um, when you're in V-fib arrest, you're in V-fib arrest, and it has nothing to do, it may have been initiated by a long QT, right? But once you're in V-fib arrest, you're just in V-fib arrest, and you need to do all the same things that you do to any V-fib arrest, and magnesium is not one of those things. The use of magnesium is if you get that person back out of, out of V-fib, and they still have a prolonged QT, you use magnesium to keep them from going back into VFib again, right? It's not a treatment for VFib, it's a prevention for VFib. So the AHA just wanted to point this out because it still appears in a, a lot of guidelines. Um, beta blocker use, okay. Uh, so there's been a lot of talk about this these past couple of years, what to do with the mostly dead patient. Um, if you guys haven't been talking about this, uh, you probably should be. We're going to talk about it at the end of this, what to do with the mostly dead patient. Um, the theory here is that you're giving epinephrine to increase systemic vascular resistance and, and perfuse the brain, but it's actually kind of toxic on the heart and to some extent the brain, and you want the pure alpha effect, but you don't want as much of the beta effects. So maybe if you give some beta blockers along with your epinephrine, um, It'll be the final thing that gets that patient out of V-fib arrest. Uh, really no human trials on this. There was one observational study um, that gave metoprolol or uh, bispropolol, uh, and it showed 72, uh, actually a pretty good increase at 72-hour survival, 
Um, however, this was a hospital intervention. This was people who already got ROSC, right? And then they gave them beta blockers in the hospital afterwards. These weren't people that were actually in arrest, so not a lot of ev evidence for that. Um, and we're back to the perennial topic of what do you do with malignant arrhythmias post ROSC? So it used to be give everybody amiodarone or lidocaine that had some sort of uh, tachyarrhythmia after ROSC. Then a couple of studies came out and said, no, you're gonna actually kill these people if you do it. And now we're having some more studies that come out and say, eh, maybe not so much so. So they're nice and ambiguous on this, saying the, uh, the evidence doesn't point us in any one direction. Um, my advice is don't do anything you don't have to do. If you can maintain a blood pressure without giving antiarrhythmics after ROSC, don't give antiarrhythmics. All right. We're almost there. So we went over the BLS stuff. That's where your bang for your buck is. We went over the latest ALS studies that have come out. Um, if you're not talking about what to do with your dead patients and mostly dead patients, you should be, right? This is old termination. Who, has, who doesn't have a termination of resuscitation rule? Protocol, written protocol that allows you to terminate patients in the field. Does anybody not have that? Okay, good. That's how things should be. Um, that's not true everywhere. So this is, old, this is the uh, Ontario pre-hospital study group. Uh, they came out with this quite a while ago. It looks like it's permeated most of the EMS uh, community. So if you have all five of these things, your chance of survival is about less than 1%. Um, so this is their termination of resuscitation rule. It doesn't include, uh, you'll notice, talking to a doctor. How many of you have to talk to a doctor to terminate? Okay. A few, a few. Yeah, look, there's non-medical reasons not to terminate in a transport. You know, I would never tell a crew not to transport a kid, right? Uh, I would never tell a, a crew not to transport something with um, extenuating circumstances, like they think that you know, hypothermia, something like this, um, bad social situation, dangerous social situation. Uh, we've transported dead, dead, dead people out of public places because you just don't leave bodies in the middle of shopping malls or in the middle of gyms or sitting in a sauna in a gym just becoming hot and bloated, things like this. Um, they, they don't need to talk to me to do those things. It's always paramedic discretion as far as I'm concerned. But, I mean, this is, this is a well-proven rule. This has been studied so many times, it's, it's not even funny. If, if this is you, you ain't gonna make it. Uh, so that's not so much of a problem, right? We got a good rule, we know where the science is, we don't have to talk to doctors, we have paramedic discretion, we know who not to transport. This is the problem right here. <clears throat> now, um, this is an old Life Pack 12, I don't know if any of you young guys recognize it, you don't have a color, back in the day we didn't have color. Um, this, what do you guys think of this? I, I love it. I love this. This is this guy. This that coarse V. You know what I'd say? Coarse for fine V fib. That's coarse V fib. That's like mm, that wants to be shocked. That's going to respond to something right there. Right. That's the kind of thing you want to press the button on. You you're feeling feeling good about that. High end tidal CO two. Right. This guy. This this is a prime. Right. So. We know how to diagnose a dead person. Right. Termination and resuscitation rule. What is predictive of a viable patient, right? So viable patient, they're young. Uh, they had bystander CPR. Well, that gets you like 6.2% survival um, from bystander CPR. Witnessed shockable rhythm, it gets you about 22%, right? That's a very shockable rhythm, really coarse VFib. Uh, agonal respirations, have you guys heard about this? Okay, so if you're in VFib and have agonal respirations, uh, what was the number on that? 16% more likely to be alive in a year, right? And theoretically, this is because your brain stem is being perfused and your brain stem's trying to tell you to breathe. Um, end tidal CO2, so if you dichotomize, um, if you look at the ROC database and dichotomize people who lived and who, who didn't, um, it was uh, end tidal CO2 of 25 versus an end tidal, uh, over 25 versus under 13. Um, so this is a very viable person here. 
Um, so what do you do? They don't meet your termination of resuscitation rule, okay? Um, they have all these markers of being um, a viable patient, right? This is the princess bride dead. Uh, well, you continue resuscitation for 30 minutes. We know from the Japanese uh, cardiac arrest registry that even after 38 minutes of, uh, of continuous CPR, they still have people with good neurological outcomes. Um, and then what? So you're at 30 minutes, and this is what you got. Recurrent or refractory VFib, maybe it gets rocked, he goes back in, great end tidal CO2, maybe the guy's waking up and swatting at you while you're doing CPR. Um, what are you gonna do with this guy, right? Change, Bait, what? Change pad placement. So double sequential, right? We can do double sequential, we can do different accesses, we can try beta blockers. No good evidence for any of these, but I mean, hell at this point, right? You can wave chicken bones at them at this point. You're kind of stuck. You can't terminate because they don't meet your termination or resuscitation. They have all the markers of a viable patient. Um, you know, what do you do with this guy? This is, this is the classic Princess Bride. Uh, Look who knows so much, yeah? Well, it just so happens that your friend here is only mostly dead. There's a big difference between mostly dead and all dead. Please open this mouth. Now, mostly dead is slightly alive. Slightly yeah. alive. All dead, well, with all dead, is usually only one thing that you can do. What's that? Go to his clothes and want to lose change. Uh, <laughs> all right, so you're in a bit of a pickle. And this, I think, should be our biggest uh, our biggest advanced topic. Obviously, we have gotta work on the basics and get more of these people, right? Because you gotta have the bystander CPR, you gotta have a viable patient to even have this problem in the first place. But it, it's not talked about as much as I would think of. Um, now you're stuck, you have a viable patient, and if you move them, you're gonna kill them. Normally, we'll talk about that. So even in simulations, even in the best of circumstances, the um, Compression fraction, when you try to move a patient, drops to about 60%. So all other things being equal, if you move them, you're going to kill them. So you're going to have to do, if, if you move them, you're going to have to do one thing. You're going to have to put them on ECMO or have some sort of mechanical compression device, right? Uh, otherwise, the decision to move is the decision. What do they say? You live and die where you lie, right? That's how we do it. Things are changing. We have these viable patients because we're getting so good at resuscitating people. They don't meet termination resuscitation rules, and we can't move them or we're gonna kill them. Now we have mechanical CPR. Don't have to call a physician out to put somebody on ECMO. Anybody can put somebody on mechanical CPR with a little bit of practice, but what now? So if you move them, you gotta be moving them somewhere where they're gonna do something different than what you're doing, right? I mean, you guys can shock people. You guys can give CPR. You can prevent hypotension. You can prevent uh, hypoxia, you can give antiarrhythmic drugs. I mean, if you're gonna take them somewhere to an ED, I've never been to an ED in the world where they do all those things as good as you guys do them, right? I mean, we get horror stories. For, I, if EMS crew ever brings somebody in in cardiac arrest, they're gonna just, I'm gonna keep them there, they're gonna run the resuscitation on their monitor, right? That's the way I do it. It doesn't happen very often. Um, because you guys are just better at it. I mean, ED docs and nurses don't know how the hell to resuscitate people. Um, <clears throat> so the AHA has recommendations for resuscitation centers, just they have recommendations for stroke centers and everything else. And they basically say, well, don't let them get hypoxic, don't let them get hypotensive, uh, cool them if they're unconscious, take them to the cath lab, uh, and this sort of details, yeah, if you got a STEMI, go emergently to the cath lab. If you don't have a STEMI, look at these factors to see if they're viable. And these are things we don't always, uh, we can't always measure. Um, and, uh, you know, if not, just send them to the ICU. If they're viable, then electively cath them. The problem with this, the AHA's recommendations and these recommendations are that they're for people who've achieved ROSC. There is no national consensus from any organization about what to do with people who are dead that you guys are keeping alive, right? So what could be done? They could take them to the cath lab, right, with mechanical CPR. They could put them on ECMO. 
Uh, they could put them on a balloon pump. They could do all of these things. But if you're moving a dead patient to a hospital, there's got to be some understanding that that hospital is going to do something about it, right? Do something that you're not doing. Um, and I think this is the big pickle we're in today. We have a not unconsiderable amount of these viable patients, and we have no clear pathway forward, right? Do we stay on scene, give them beta blockers, double sequential, put them on a, put them on a mechanical device, take them to the ED and go, here, you know? You know, is that ED doc going to be able to get a cardiologist or a cardiothoracic surgeon down to do something about it? I don't know. Not at my institution. At my institution, you're just going to get the same old stuff you were getting inside the hospital or outside of the hospital. You're just not going to get it as good. All right. So the biggest bang for your buck is bystander CPR. We good for bystander CPR. All right. Definite, like plus, plus, plus. Next biggest bang for your buck, bystander defibrillation, plus, plus, plus. This is where our mortality benefit is. Amiodarone versus lidocaine? Yes. I mean, only a single plus. It's going to help a little bit. Uh, epi? Maybe. Early versus late? I don't know. Heads up CPR? Maybe. Uh, you need mechanical CPR. You need to train on it and, and work out the logistics of, of it. Uh, airways, dealer's choice, but I wouldn't go for uh, I wouldn't go for endotracheal intubation unless you have data that says you're good. Not you know you're good because we all know we're good, but unless you have data that says you're good. Uh, magnesium, know what it's for. It's for prevention, not treatment. Beta blockers, hey, if you've got a viable patient that you can't get out of EFib, why not? Not going to hurt them. Same thing with double sequential or different access. I mean, you're not going to hurt anybody with it, and if they're dead, they're dead already. You got to do something. Uh, transport, only if you have somewhere to go, right? Every transport involves a risk to you and the patient. And if you're not buying your patient anything, even if it's a viable patient, you've got to come up with something. And to the medical directors, don't leave your uh, medics hanging. You know, you've got to come up with something. Uh, if you have to modify your termination resuscitation rule, but don't, don't, let, don't let the code leader hang out there for an hour with a viable patient and have no instructions for what to do. You know, this is, this is our job to come up with something in the face of the science we have. And my time's up. Um, so I'll take questions in the back. Do we have time for questions? Yes. OK. I'll take questions then. All right. Either it was really boring or I answered all your questions. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Sorry about that. It's my great, great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Chief Sean Grayson from the Rialto Fire Department, who's going to be talking about some of their great successes in uh, treating sudden cardiac arrest. Some people left. I don't want to hear anymore. We're probably still missing a couple people, but uh, thanks uh, to the doc. That was an awesome presentation. Uh, we don't. We're from Southern California. We, we have some great docs, but we don't often get ones that can translate you know, the science and the data into something that's actionable in a system. So that's uh, pretty amazing. Um, so uh, I'm up here to talk about a couple things. Uh, you probably don't want death by PowerPoint, so we'll go through them uh, one by one. But uh, my name is Sean Grayson. I'm the fire chief in the city of Rialto, which is in Southern California, San Bernardino County. Um, home of uh, a terrorist attack about four years ago, unfortunately. If, uh, for those of you that uh, watch national news and don't care about Southern California, that's probably the only other time you might have heard of us. Um, I'm the least important person in our fire department. Um, my job is really to be a cheerleader. Um, I don't put out fires. I don't uh, take people to the hospital. I don't do CPR. Well, I do occasionally. but um, So I'm really here representing what the men and women of the Rialto Fire Department uh, have done in changing the uh, course of survival in Rialto. Um, we're going to talk uh, a lot today in the next hour about what we did, how we did it, and the culture of it. Um, and stay to tomorrow, and you'll get uh, some hands-on experience in, in doing what our folks do. Um, so it's not rocket science. If it was, we wouldn't be doing it. Um, so, uh, But it has made a huge difference in our community. Uh, I don't have any conflicts or disclosures. I get paid by a municipal government agency and nobody else can pay me. And if anybody wants to pay me more money, that'd be great in a couple years from when I retire. But until then, 
So I, I like to start with um, the things that we've learned that we were doing wrong, and it was a lot of things. Um, the men and women of the Rialto Fire Department have proved that um, almost everything I did in my career, I'm a recovering paramedic, um, was wrong, especially in cardiac arrest. Um, so uh, I say that your assumptions, my assumptions, our collective assumptions are limiting the survivor pool from cardiac arrest. Um, I'm guessing that's true in your community, but uh, you can let me know. Who's that guy? <laughs> What's his name? The one on the left. Dr. Evil, all right. So uh, what's that word? Somebody say it. Evil. 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 All right, so you made some assumptions there, right? We're speaking English today, and, and we read from left to right, and um, we all make assumptions all day, every day about a lot of things, um, and which can be good. It can lead us to the right answer, but assumptions can very easily lead you to the wrong answer and you all made the wrong answer. Because um, I asked you what that word was and you chose to look at it the wrong way. So that word is live. You just sp spelled it wrong. Your assumptions led you to the wrong answer. You could argue with me whether my question was clear, it doesn't matter. So I ask you this, that rhythm, I tell you what it is at the top. Don't tell me that's fine V-fib or some other BS thing that you have. Uh, that rhythm is what? Asystole. Survival from that rhythm in your community. What is, what's your expectation? You walk up, unwitnessed arrest, unknown downtime. What's your expectation? They all die? Not going not gonna to work it very long. I heard that. A couple rounds and we're going to call it. You have a protocol like the doc brought up, right? I, I would agree. Um, in my community, our expectation is that same word. Why? 20% neurologically intact survival from that rhythm. Put it a different way, a higher neurologically intact survival from that rhythm than we had from VFib five years ago. Why? Well, our assumptions were wrong. We were doing things wrong. We all do CPR. It's not the what, it's the how. So changing your assumptions really is another way to say a cultural change. How many of you have really easy time changing culture in your organization? No? Fire, EMS, people super receptive to change, right? They're like, hey, what's new today? I want to find out. Uh, yeah, for, for me too, for my organization too. Um, so, uh, but how do you change your assumptions? How do you make a cultural change? So this is we're going to kind of share with you our, our, our trip, um, so to speak. Um, so all of these folks are making assumptions. And because they're wearing lab coats, or uh, I'm gonna assume they're doctors, so they're smarter than me. Um, they are all right. Their assumptions have led them to a conclusion which is right based on their experiences, right? So the guy up front says it's a spear, it's a snake, it's a, they're right. Their brain, you're never gonna convince their, their brain that they're wrong because they've made a series of assumptions based on their previous experiences and they've come to a conclusion and we all like to believe our conclusions are right. So how do you change your assumptions? Challenge all of your beliefs that speak to outcomes and survival. Is that easy? So we could start with uh, ALS saves lives. Have you ever heard that? Paramedics save lives. Well, you went to paramedic school or nursing school or medical school for a reason, right? Probably not true not in the cardiac arrest situation, especially not if the ALS things you're doing are compromising the BLS things we know work. So we're gonna talk a lot about how you change assumptions, how you change culture. So this is where Rialto started. Um, not started, but this is where our journey in cardiac arrest started. Um, we were on paper patient care reports. So we had, and we still have, a ton of data in boxes in a warehouse on a street. I don't even know where that street is, right? So no actionable intelligence, plenty of data, which fast forward, we got into the electronic patient care report and then we had a ton of data and we didn't know what to do with it, but we figured it out. Um, I had the fortune in 2014 to do um, some research on outcomes in STEMI stroke and cardiac arrest in Rialto and we had, we had no outcome data. We'll start with that. We were not a CARES participant at the time. 
Um, outcome data was basically somebody calling uh, a phone number. Is Mr. Rodriguez here? He says, yes. Well, that's awesome. That's a survivor, right? Because we're calling the guy that, all right. Um, hey, can we come talk to you and look at your discharge paperwork and find out what CPC means? But we're 23% ROSC, which you can imagine was not, most of those weren't survivors. Half of them were survivors, which is better than anybody else around us, but not nearly as good as we should have been. So I also had the fortune of coming to an organization, an amazing organization filled with great men and women uh, who had a mission, vision, and value statement on a wall and nobody knew what it meant. Nobody knew who wrote it. Nobody cared about what it said. So we said, well, let's, let's change that, right? So we went through that exercise. What does the organization think that the mission, why are we here? Where should we be? And they wrote, not me, they wrote into the mission statement at the bottom, you'll see, we are committed to meet the public's needs with compassionate service, professionalism, and innovation. Innovation is in my mission statement. So if I'm in charge of this organization, and allegedly I am, then I have to be innovative. Then they wrote something else that really makes my job hard. And it says, the second bullet point under vision, the vision of the Rialto Fire Department is to be an organization that brings value to the community measured in lives saved and quality of life protected. Measured in lives saved and quality of life protected. So if I'm not measuring it and we're not doing it, then I don't live up to the piece of paper that they wrote that we hang on every station. So that's huge, right? So the organization got to drive our future and every day we try to live up to that vision. So innovation's the key. I'm talking about a paradigm shift, not a protocol change. Innovation is not counting how many IV sticks you had or what the success rate was. Innovation is not about a linear change. Innovation is not even about, people say, uh, think outside the box. I'm not talking about that kind of innovation. Briefly, because you could take a semester long class from me on this and none of you would want to. The 11 types of innovation in business mode, that's, I'm a firefighter, or I was at one point before I made a stupid decision to take a test. Um, There's 10 types and there's too many nine types. Oh, we got cartoons, that's helping, but still to me eight. So we work on four innovation types. So um, the model is that magenta color, pink color upper right hand corner, breakout concept innovation. That's not think outside the box, that's imagining that there never was a box. Um, because this is what we did. On the right hand side, stop benchmarking. So the nice way to say it is uh, when best practices are not good enough. The other way to say it is when the best of the best is better called the cream of the crap, you don't wanna do what everyone else is doing. Everyone else has a 10% survival rate from cardiac arrest. Right, 90% of the people die. Why are we doing what they're doing? Let's do what they're not doing. Let's do something different. Imagine there's no box. Start with the end state in mind. What do I mean by that? Well, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, ignore past failures. Is that something easy in fire and EMS? To just, no, because people are gonna bring up forever, right? Remember that one time 27 years ago that you did this thing? Yeah. But you have to be willing to jump out there and number one, say, I messed it up my whole life, right? My whole career, and I don't want you to. I don't want that to be the legacy of this organization. And in our situation, built on prior cultural successes, like I said, amazing organization that had some successful organizational change and cultural change items, and so we really capitalized on that. So it starts with what uh, Jim Collins would call a big, hairy, audacious goal. Big, hairy, audacious goal. Is that like we'll increase uh, our first uh, innovation rate by 5% next year? Is that a big, hairy, audacious goal? Mm, not so much. All right. Um, so big, hairy, audacious goal is what landed us on the moon. So John F. Kennedy, 1961, in front of Congress, this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him home safely to the earth. Did he even know that was possible when he said that? Did he have any money to do that? No, he's standing in front of Congress telling him that you better appropriate some money to make this happen, right? Big, hairy, audacious goal. Did we achieve it? Unless you're a conspiracy theorist, we did. Uh, 
We, uh, we live just down the road from NASA JPL, where they commonly shoot lasers against a mirror that's sitting on the surface of the moon that a human put there. So I'm pretty sure when that laser beam comes back that, that we did land on the moon. Here's mine. We commit to flipping the script so that survival from cardiac arrest in Rialto is the norm, not the exception. The norm, not the exception. So our big carry audacious goal would be that 90% would be the survivors and 10% would be the not instead of 10% will be the survivors and 90% the not. Is that a decent, big, carry audacious goal? I'll give you another one. Uh, you're going to hear from my EMS chief a little bit later here, and this is his. Um, we've been working on the TXA trial. Well, it's not a trial anymore. Um, and uh, for our entire careers, we, in critical trauma with low blood pressures or even decent blood pressures, we'd start two large bore IVs and put it on blood tubing and cram as much fluid in as possible, pretty much guaranteeing that they were not going to survive. So his big carry audacious goal is we need to make the clot, not wash it away with fluid. So that's what led us down that path. So key point to if you're going to do all these things is you don't want that to just be some goal that somebody else thinks is crazy. You got to get the organization to come along with you. So I say this, put it in writing. If you want the organization to go somewhere, put it in writing. Meet with the doers face to face. Who are the doers? Chiefs? Medical directors? No, right? Paramedics on the street. Tie the vision to the organization's culture. All of you know your organization's culture. You know that there are deal breakers. You know there are things that people love and things that people hate. Find a way to tie your big, hairy, audacious goal to your organization and their culture. Ask people to join you. I'm the chief, right? I could say, you'll do it. Does that work? It only works to the extent that they'll comply so that they won't get fired, right? But what works really well is, hey, uh, this train is going to Albuquerque. You know, this train is going to increase cardiac arrest survival. Will you come with me? Will you hop on the train? Does everybody hop on the train? What do you think? In your organization, would everyone hop on the train? Would 50% plus one hop on the train? Probably not. Would 10% say, we should do this, and begrudgingly force another 40% plus one to get on the train? Yeah, and that's good enough. Because the rest comes in, hopefully you were right and you can prove it. Uh, be honest, that seems like it should be, you shouldn't have to write that down. That's like Joe Powell will tell you. We don't have a policy that says don't eat broken glass. Um, because it should be self-evident, but sometimes they're not. Engage your champions. You need champions at every level of your organization, from the newest person to the oldest person and in every rank. What do I mean by champions? Somebody that says, we should do this. I'm not even sure that it'll work, but we should do this. And don't expect everyone to jump in. So, plan for innovation. What can your plan be? Absolutely anything you want it to be, except for whatever you're doing today. Because if whatever you were doing today was the greatest thing since sliced bread, you probably wouldn't be here, right? If you were, if you said, we have the highest survival rate from cardiac arrest in the nation, and it can never get any better, you wouldn't be sitting in this room today. And I can't say that about my organization, although that 81% that you saw in the CARES data on the high end might come from my organization. Um, but. We want to be better. That's why we're here, to learn from you guys. Something you have to do if you want to make this leap of innovation is you have to focus on what's really important. You have to fo focus on the big, carry audacious goal. You have to stand back and be willing to stop practices that don't make sense. No one would look at that picture and think that's the way to do CPR. Yet today, we do practices that an untrained observer, my wife, who's not a, she's a doctor, but not that kind of doctor, would stand back and, and look at it and go, what? that's dumb, why would you do that? So what's the natural thing? I just don't ask her, because I know she would think it's dumb. I know she would tell me to stop doing that. You have to be willing to look at things critically and say, if it's dumb or it doesn't work, we got to stop doing it. So <clears throat> this was the first auto pulse. Uh, no, not really, but um, mechanical CPR has been around for a long time. This thing used to rock people back to life, right? 
So it was an innovative thought, but not the kind of innovation we're talking about. There is no silver bullet. There's no silver bullet. There's not one thing that's going to save cardiac arrest, folks. Um, there's a lot of big ticket items, but there's not one thing. And, and we can prove that with our data in Rialto and in a lot of other places. Let's talk about um, learning from other medical innovations. ACLS has been, Joe, did you do this first class? You're the instructor? Yes? OK. Uh, so ACLS has been around since 1979, right? Uh, third National Conference on CPR, survival from cardiac arrest in 1979 in the out of hospital arena was about 8%. What is it today? About 8%, give or take, right? So we're not, we've, well, we put a lot of paramedics on the street and we've changed a lot of things in hospitals and we bought a lot of fancy stuff and we haven't changed much. In some pockets, we've changed tremendously and in other pockets, we've gotten worse. 1979, Hodgkin's lymphoma survival rate was 5%. You were going to die if you had it for the most part. Today, one of the most treatable and survivable cancers when caught early, 92% survival rate. So we, we did better in that regard, right? Paramedics don't treat that, I don't think. Uh, things have changed since I went to paramedic school, but not that much. How about HIV, AIDS? We didn't even call it that uh, in 1979. Um, and it was mostly in two metropolitan areas of San Francisco and, and uh, New York. Um, survival rate from HIV was 0%. Everyone that got HIV would get AIDS and would die um, in the early 80s. Today, it's considered a treatable chronic disease. The lifespan after diagnosis is 70 years. 70 years. Statistically, someone diagnosed early with HIV will die from something else, most likely cardiac arrest. Um, so. What's the deal? What's the difference? Why have we come so far with those? Well, <clears throat> it's about synergy. What did they do with the treatment of those? They use a bundle of care. How do they treat HIV? What? So they had antiretrovirals in 1979. They had three of them exactly. And they tried them all each individually. And what happened? Nothing. So what did they do? There's actually four meds now, but it used to be called a triple cocktail. So that bundle of care did what? Stopped the virus from replicating. It's pretty awesome. How about lymphoma? They used to do what? Give chemo, and it did what? Nothing. So they added radiation and early forms of biologics, and it did what? Put people into remission. It's not one thing. There's no silver bullet. It's a bundle of care, OK? So let's talk about Rialto's bundle of care. A lot of this follows what the doc brought up earlier. It's we didn't, we didn't invent anything. We stole it from somebody else. I would highly encourage you to steal whatever you do from somebody else. Steal it from somebody else that's looked at the science and come up with a way that works. So just on the pre-hospital arena, um, we, we really have three bundles of care for our community, for ourselves, and for the in-hospital folks. Um, our community is this, we call them community superheroes. Those are the people that Doc brought up earlier. If someone does CPR on you before EMS gets there, you're more likely to survive. Everyone agrees with that, right? Everyone agrees that if you use an AED before we got there, you're more likely to survive. Have AEDs been an awesome success in your community? You put hundreds of them out there and they're used every day? No? How, in your communities, 20% or less of cardiac arrests are in a public place. Would you give me that ballpark? Most of them are in homes. How many AEDs do you have in people's homes? Not so many. So maybe the mobile thing that the doc was talking about is better, and, and we're working on that too. So we have training on recognition and response. We have dispatch-assisted CPR program. The data the doc was talking about before, it is um, older data. It's you know the, uh, the turn of the millennium. Um, and that was in a time when there was not good defined way to get to CPR instructions. And I think if you'll find, how many of you have no, no, go for get to CPR? How many of you have uh, EMD process that gets you to CPR for, for victims? Either of those will quickly get a dispatcher to help with CPR. The person on the other side that already started CPR will all st 
still be better than the person who waited to get instructions. But if you can more quickly get to instructions, then you'll save more lives. Hands-only CPR, California is not a blue state. On the slide he had up there before, the dark blue was all the states without laws. We have a law now um, that requires us to teach, well, we don't have to teach it, but somebody's got to teach CPR. So uh, our staff taught all the high school seniors uh, CPR this year. Um, and that picture you see on the right, that is Pulse Point, which is an app that people can download that will show them when someone needs CPR, show them where the nearest AED is. Those four people are Myler High School students who had been trained in CPR two days before. So when we train them in CPR and AED, we make them download the Pulse Point app. Like, hey, okay, we know you can't have your phone out at school, but this is the one exception. Download the Pulse Point app. So they're at Carl's Jr. at lunch, and the person across the street needs CPR. So what they do? We got two of them walked. The other two got in their car, drove over there, grabbed an AED, did CPR. That's connecting the person in cardiac arrest to the AED that has been woefully unsuccessful. It was just hanging on the wall for the last 10 years um, with technology to the people that we just trained in CPR. So I completely agree, Doc, that uh, it's going to take us a long time to find um, those trends in the data where we're training more people in CPR and getting more people to do bystander CPR quickly. But anecdotally, two days after we trained them, that's a survivor. It's important, it's part of, the, part of the system. Another big part is that you have real-time feedback on CPR for your bystanders, for your paramedics, for your doctors in the hospital. How many people are proficient? I mean 90% in rate, depth, and recoil with manual CPR without feedback. Um, me and my staff have been all over this planet and have never found a person that can do that. We haven't found people that can do it with feedback at 90%. So I would challenge you that if you are using manual CPR with or without feedback, I challenge you to look at your data and see how well you're doing. Because of all the things you heard from me and from the doc, what's the one thing that we know works? CPR. But it's not what you do, it's how you do it. And I would imagine some of you are like I was for my whole career, you're doing it wrong. And by doing it wrong, I mean you're doing it crappy. I don't mean you intend to be. I mean you are. It's a factual statement. I can prove that I did crappy CPR. I would suggest that you should find out if you are too. But you need to know the rate, depth, and recoil of every compression given to that patient from the bystander all the way through the continuum of care. And you need to know every ventilation. Because the other way you can kill someone, besides not enough CPR, is too much ventilation. What do you think the average ventilation rate is in cardiac arrest? 30? Yeah. If you have the opportunity, if you have video of some of your cardiac arrests, and, and we do, and certainly places like Vegas do, and in um, casinos and things like that, when we looked at 100 cases, the average was 40, 40 times a minute, because we have muscle memory for this. And what do we do when the bag fills back up? Well, this is my only job, so I'm just going to squeeze it again. I'm not saying they're doing anything wrong. I'm saying they're doing what we trained them to do, and we don't give them a feedback mechanism that says, stop it. No more. So we do in Rialto. That is not acceptable. But so data is the key. How many of you would bet money or go to court saying that what's written in an electronic patient care record is exactly what happened? Would you give me it as your best recollection of what happened, uh, colored by what the protocol says, and the fact that you don't want to get in trouble? So it's probably closer to that than it is exactly what happened. Yeah, so I don't care what the report says. We're working on ways to get to the point where the report says exactly what happened, but I care what actually happened. So you need that too. You need data that shows you every compression, every recoil, every ventilation, the moment of ROSC. Blood pressure and pulse oximetry on dead people is important. It'll make a difference. Sounds stupid, right? How many of you are putting blood pressure cuffs on all your cardiac arrest victims today? It'll make a difference. So you need data. Do firefighters and EMS people like data-driven things? Do they like to be told that, uh, hey, uh, I know you documented X, but I really see Y? They love that. They love getting a phone call from the QI guy on the way back from the hospital. They don't, 
right? But if it saves more lives and you tell them, you're never going to get in trouble. All you have to do is tell me the truth. No matter how bad you messed it up, it'll be okay. We've never disciplined anybody. We've learned more from failures than we have from anything else. Because when they do it right, what happens? Well, they live or they die. When they do it wrong and they live or they die, that gives us an insight into what we're doing and whether what we're doing is right or wrong because they deviated. So we need folks to tell us the truth and we need the data to back it up. So here's our toolbox. It's on the cover of GEMS Magazine. Doesn't mean anything to me, but it's nice for my folks. Their picture on there. I think I had to pay them extra for you know Screen Actors Guild rights or something um, to be on there. But um, this is our toolbox. We'll run through it. Um, continuous high quality CPR. This was before we came up with this saying uh, before Trump was president. Nothing trumps compressions. Nothing. So you know how I'm on time, Terry. Um, so. We believe that, and we can prove that our, at least our organization cannot, cannot perform high quality manual CPR for any prolonged period of time. It's not because they're not great people, it's not because they're not well trained. It's because you can't do it. Humans weren't designed to do that. So we say nothing trumps compressions, nothing. And when I say that, I mean longest pauses in cardiac arrest, 4.4 seconds. That's good. I'll take that. How many of you have that? A 30 minute cardiac arrest where the longest pause is 4.4 seconds. It'll make a difference. Tomorrow we'll show you how. We define the acceptable pauses of CPR. It's a simple saying. If you don't define the acceptable pauses of CPR, there will be more pauses than are acceptable. Does that make sense? How many of you define when you can pause CPR on your system? How many of you have seen someone stop CPR and then be off the chest for a prolonged period of time until somebody says, hey, get back on CPR? Yeah, we don't have muscle memory to get back on the chest, right? We, we stopped because there was you know, a need for a pulse check or a defibrillation or for an intubation or there was a shiny object, firefighters, right? Um, and then we don't get right back on the chest. So you know, a little social engineering Define those pauses, and with mechanical CPR, make sure you never turn it off. We use apneic oxygenation, which is just a fancy way of saying we put a nasal cannula in their nose at 15 liters a minute. And why do we do this? Well, do you stop compressions to do CPR, I mean to do innovation in your system? No, never? Sometimes? Yes? Occasionally? How long do you stop? Too long? All right, well, what if you had pulse oximetry and capnography on this patient and, and you had this nasal cannula in and their pulse ox was good and their capnography was good, how long do you have to intubate? Hold your breath. You have an infinite amount of time because their pulse ox and their capnography are good. You get a very small tidal volume, a very high minute volume from the compressions, right? And so they're breathing, they're fine. That gets us to not stopping compressions to intubate the patient. Social engineering. Use of an ITD, impedance threshold device. How many of you use an ITD? One, two, a couple. How many of you know what an ITD is? Cool. How many of you can spell ITD? That's, that's for my staff, sorry. Um, so we use an impedance threshold device. We'll talk about it a lot tomorrow. Um, the doc talked about it before. Um, it is, uh, it's a blood in, blood out thing. So the dead end circuit or the dead end hydrant in your vascular system is your brain. So if you don't get the blood out of there, then you're just water hammering every time you do a compression in that brain, right? And the stuff you're not getting out of there is acidotic and hypoxic, and the stuff you're not getting out of there is also altering your preload, decreasing your preload. This helps us in those regards and also helps with the heart. We do heads up CPR on the human model, not the pig model, right? So um, we think in aggregate there's about 2,800 cases of heads up CPR um, throughout the country in the last 12 months. So there is human data. So we'll try to get 
that information out, but the reality is heads up CPR, very easy to do with an auto pulse, very difficult, near impossible to do in any other configuration other than automated CPR, makes a big difference. The doc talked about um, agonal respirations. The data is that anybody that is gasping during any phase of cardiac arrest has an increased survival over those who are not. What you'll see with heads up and an ITD in place is almost every single patient that is going to survive will begin gasping. Why? Because you're perfusing their brain enough that they try to breathe on their own. Anybody know what gasping looks like on n 2 waveform capnography? You get these nice little waves when you're breathing form, right? When they try to breathe against your adjunct, it spikes way up and then comes back down. It almost looks like a QRS complex. You probably won't see them doing it because you're not looking at their face when they're breathing, but you can definitely see it on the monitor. That is a good sign. That is somebody that's going to survive. Just get their heart started again. We delay defibrillation. People hate. This is the, the next two things you're not going to like. Maybe even the doc, especially. What's that rhythm? The one on the left. V-fib. And then there's a, there's a little line there. The monitor doesn't make that line anymore. But what's the subsequent rhythm after defibrillation? Asystole. What's the survival uh, when we convert someone from V-fib to asystole? Not very good. So we are following the HA guidelines. What does the HA say? Early defibrillation. Is there a definition of that? The period of refractory from cardiac arrest during which time the heart can be successfully defibrillated into a pulsatile rhythm. Is that, is that early defibrillation then? No. So it's early till it's not early. So we don't defibrillate fine V-fib with entitled CO2s under 20. Why? Because statistically they all do that. ROSC in my system with defibrillations of fine V-fib under 20, zero. ROSC in my system with coarse V-fib or V-fib over 20, 80. It's a little higher than that, 82%. Which category you want to be in? How about AEDs? Do AEDs shock all people in, in V-fib? Does an AED know if they're in V-fib? No. Does it use math to determine if they're shockable? Yep, it does, right? It doesn't know. It's using math. We're doing the same thing. We're using math and outcomes to drive. We don't want to shock them to asystole and kill them. It's not a huge subset of our patients, but it's some. You mad at me now? No? Sounds stupid? Makes a difference. Waveform capnography. How many of you use waveform capnography on every single cardiac arrest victim? How many of you use it from the very first breath in the BLS airway circuit? How many of you use it to determine for determination of death? For how long you spend on scene? How many of your hospitals use it in the ER? That is the most amount of hands I've ever seen. Usually the ER has it and doesn't use it. So we use waveform capnography for a lot of things, um, drive just about every decision um, that we have. Um, it's the best glimpse we have today into, I mean, it is metabolism, right? Cells are active, they're burning oxygen and exchanging CO2. Um, hopefully by next year we'll have regional oximetry as well on cardiac arrest victims and that'll give us another glimpse into uh, perfusion of the brain. We deprioritize epinephrine. You heard a lot about epinephrine. Um, we agree that the science is muddy. I think, this is me, Sean Grayson, that there's a place for epinephrine. I just don't know where it's at, and the science hasn't illustrated that for us. What I do know is that in the very early stages of cardiac arrest, um, the patient is hypoxic, acidotic, and their brain cannot sustain the increased intracranial pressure and the decreased cerebral perfusion pressure of the insult of epinephrine. Some people can. Some people, you give them 50 milligrams and they're still going to live despite your efforts. Other people are definitely going to die. So what do we do? Well, we split the baby, so to speak. So we say, our protocol is a milligram of epinephrine every five minutes. Doesn't say when. So we say you can do it. 
after all the other things that we know make a difference are done. The social engineering component is all intubated patients in our system get an NG tube. The person that does the NG tube is the vascular access person and they can't establish vascular access till the NG tube's in. So once the NG tube's in, they can drill a hole in their arm and give them epinephrine if they want. But that gives us the pause of the period of do everything else that makes a difference that we know saves lives and then it's okay to give epinephrine. And we'll talk about a lot of this tomorrow. That's our wheel of survival. You do everything in, in order and eventually you drop down into post ross care. The results, this is our system. Couple of years, retrospective data, ROSC. 23% before we started, the only thing we added by itself was the ITD. We went from 23% to 40%. With all of our tools, for all comers, for all rhythms, our ROSC rate is 60% and our Utstein is 83%. Well, what's the, I don't care about those numbers. I honestly could give a crap. I care about people going home neurologically intact. So what's the survival for all those patients? Well, it varies. So for the Utstein, it doesn't vary much by 2%. Essentially all the people that are shockable that we get back stay alive. Um, and we drop off by about half for most of our unshockables. PEAs and asystoles um, range between 20 and 40 percent neurologically intact survival. Uh, another way to say that is we've tripled the number of people that go home alive this year versus two years ago. So I get to meet three times as many people. Three times as many people get to, we just had one the other day, um, at an Amazon, it looks remarkable like the one that you drove past on the way in here, um, and uh, he just got to witness the birth of his first grandson the other day. That's what we're in it for. The numbers are important to you probably, so you don't call BS on me all day long, but they're less important to us. We just care about people going home. It really is a process, not a project. Tomorrow we're going to talk a lot about avoiding confirmation bias. What's confirmation bias? Selecting the data that supports your point of view. It's easy to do, right? So I don't want to hear about the things that say we're doing it well. I want to celebrate success, but I don't want to hear about, I want to hear about the things that say we're doing it wrong, right? Because I don't want to live by confirmation bias, and we'll talk about that a lot. Another way to say that is don't believe your own hype. In our system, there's a zero tolerance for failures, but we accept that failures will happen. Nobody gets in trouble for doing something wrong. Just tell us the truth. We learn a lot from failures. That's a lot of our data set is comparing when we did it right versus when we did it wrong. So we have failures and we have epic failures. That's, it's hard to get a picture of epic failure in cardiac arrest. That's just an example of one on a wildland fire. Generally speaking, I would prefer you not get our wildland rigs stuck on train tracks to put out the wildland fire. That's a two and a half million dollar an hour railroad line. So. Jeremiah, who's in the back, wasn't driving that day, but I'm pretty sure he doesn't want to pay that check. Um, <clears throat> epic failure. Not just one thing went wrong, everything went wrong. Do you have those in your system? We do too. That's how we learned about not defibrillating fine V-fib, the end tidal CO2 under 20, because we had to go back and look, somebody really messed up. So we looked back at the data and said, well, if that good medic that's well-trained messed up, who else messed up? So you look at all the data. Right? That's how we got it. So from the top of the organization, being the cheerleader, being the least important person, when you set that big, hairy, audacious goal and you look down the road uh, towards your vision, um, my job and your job if you're in that role or any role in management is to remove the roadblocks. You can see them. Move the roadblocks out of the way. But you won't see the potholes until you get up close. So here are some potholes that we came across that you don't have to, you can avoid. Reality check, ground truth, field vet everything. Just because it sounds good to the chief doesn't mean it can actually happen in the field, right? Because what do the men and women that work for me say when we teach them? Okay, sounds good. And then what do they do? Not that, because they're like, you're crazy, that doesn't work. So you definitely have to do that. Let everyone know you won't get in trouble. If you work for an organization that's gonna punish somebody for not having the exact right compression fraction, that's this is going to be hard to make cultural change. So um, nobody gets in trouble in our system for making mistakes. I just ask that they not make the same mistake twice in a row. 
make a new and different mistake we can learn from. Write everything down. It's a process, not a project. Don't expect immediate compliance. Get your champions involved in the science. It's like the doctor presented earlier, the science is important. Understanding the why we do things is often more important than the how we do it. Because we can teach them how, and they'll only do it for long enough until they forget. But if we teach them why and then how, they're locked in. Celebrate everything, and we do. Give feedback on every resuscitation. Build a culture of survival. So whether it's being on the cover of GEMS Magazine, whether it's our open house where all of our survivors come back and you know I get to give them hugs and shake their hands, whether it's something kind of geeky and nerdy like the lower left-hand corner, our Class A uniforms have EMS life-saving ribbon. Every year we reissue the number that's in the center of that ribbon. Uh, we're in the triple digits now. Three years of a program, individuals with three digits of survivors uh, on their Class A uniform. Celebrating the dispatchers, that's a dispatcher that gave instructions that created a survivor on the right-hand side there. All of those things are important, and we'll talk about them tomorrow. Don't forget about your hospitals. We have hospital folks in the room, right? Um, so this is a follow-up report um, on a um, post-arrest STEMI. And so you'll see um, chief complaint, paramedic interpretation, ED physician interpretation, cardiologist interpretation. It was an inferior STEMI. There's the before and after um, that, they, um, that they crossed the lesion. That's the uh, 12 lead on the left-hand side. And even from the back of the room, you can probably figure out that that one is not very good for the patient. Um, so if you don't get feedback like this on every stroke, STEMI, and, and cardiac arrest from your hospitals, ask them if they have it. Your medics will like it. Some of them will ignore it, but other ones will be like, oh, that's cool. Some of them might find out that the person that they got ROSC on actually lived, because today maybe in your system they don't even know what the outcomes are. So this part's important. So uh, stay for the rest of the day. Tomorrow we're going to show you that it's, uh, like I said earlier, it's not rocket science. Um, but it, it's a cultural change, but anybody can do it. Any organization, ALS, BLS, paramedics, first responders, EMS systems, it doesn't matter. Anybody can do what we do, and you'll probably do it better than us. Um, because we made a lot of mistakes. Um, but I would like to uh, introduce someone uh, who's in the back of the room. His name is Jeremiah Mendoza. He's an engineer paramedic in our organization. And what's really important to me is that I'm the fire chief, so it doesn't matter. It, uh, I'm not the one that saves lives. What's important to me is that the men and women that do the work get the recognition, but also that they can share with you um, their interpretation. So. Uh, he's not on the clock right now. He has free reign to say whatever he wants. We're being recorded, so he can't use cuss words. I hope not very many words anyway. Um, but he's just going to share with you what this cultural uh, change has meant to him as one of the people that actually do this for a living. All right. Um, I'm going to keep this short. I'm going to keep it sweet because uh, I know we're all ready for lunch. And I'm more of a kind of one-on-one -on -one type of person. so. If you guys got questions today, tomorrow, anything like that, hit me up. Um, I can't tell you how many times we've actually done this. I can't tell you how many times I didn't do this. So um, uh, some of the things that we dealt with in Rialto were a smaller department. Um, we've got a lot of people there that have 10, 15, 20 years as a medic on scene. Uh, we have our own ambulances, so we had a lot of people that did um, the same thing for, for decades prior to all of these changes. So there was definitely, there was growing pain, so there was people that didn't want to do it, there was people that did want to do it. There was people that liked some of the stuff, didn't like some of the other stuff. There's a, a lot of easy stuff to implement, you know, okay, rescue pod, that's easy. We innovate them, we throw something else on. Okay, capnography, easy. Um, apneic oxygenation, easy. Then there were other things where there was definitely a, a little bit of pushback. Uh, we're going to stay on scene for 30 minutes. We got family members that are freaking out. We got people that don't know what's going on. How are we going to tell them we're staying here with a, a patient that's critical and we got a hospital five minutes away and we're staying here? Um, we're going to put them on the gurney and not put them in the ambulance and then not go somewhere. So there was a lot of things that, that took some, some convincing. There's a lot of things that um, 
a lot of us did, myself included, that we weren't convinced about. We're looking at it going, okay, well, they're telling us to do it. They have some good reasonings behind it. We'll give it a shot. Uh, so there was, it was a process. It wasn't a full bundle like you're looking at. Um, there was a timeline that, that kind of went along with this. There was, uh, we started with Auto Pulse. Then we added Rescue Pod. Then we're going, okay, for a little period of time, it's like, what are we, okay, Joe, what are we doing this week? Because last week we were doing this, I took a day off, and I know there was a class, and I know we're doing something different. So there was a lot of, uh, of well, I don't know, maybe a six-month period where we're like, oh, man, every week we're changing how we run a cardiac arrest. Uh, am I doing it right this week? Am I doing it wrong this week? Um, but there were four things that, as they, they asked me to come and speak, and there was four things that really um, I found got myself to buy in. I can't speak for anybody else, but the first thing was, was the character of our chief, the character of Chief Powell, and knowing that their number one priority wasn't, you know, um, just making us follow the rules. Their number one priority is taking care of people. So, uh, with us, if Joe ever comes to us and asks us, or Chief Powell, um, I know Ms. Joe, uh, if he ever comes to us and asks us to do something, it's because he wants to do the right thing by the people that we serve. So, that was, for me, number one. I trust him, I trust his character, um, and we have a, a pretty good culture at our department. I tell all the new guys, look, if you do the right thing, if you have a reason why you did it, you will not get in trouble. So there was freedom for us to kind of, to do the right thing. There's freedom for us to try new things. There's freedom for us to, to make mistakes, to come and tell them, hey, we made a mistake. Hey, we forgot to do this. Hey, we didn't do this. Hey, it was two in the morning, and we did everything the way we used to do everything, because we were tired and we just went to muscle memory. And we worked through it, we worked hard, um, and we knew the character of the people who were asking us to make the change. Uh, number two, um, they were passionate about this. They believed in it. They bought into it, so it made us, it made it easier for us to buy into it. Um, again, so if you guys want to make changes, first one is uh, the character and the culture. The second one is their passion and their buy-in, which made us kind of, if they are this serious about it, if they believe in it this much, if they've already put in so much groundwork, so much research, then we should at least give it a shot. I mean, who knows if it'll work? I mean, I was one of the, yeah, who knows if it'll work? But they've already put so many man hours into trying to figure some of this stuff out that we're gonna give it a shot. Um, they came to us with the science about it. It wasn't just, hey, let's just do this. Well, why? Because uh, we're telling you. There was science behind it. I can't tell you how many classes we sat through and how many CEs I got for cardiac arrest, cardiac survivability, and they made a point to tell us not just what we're doing, but why we're doing it. Because at the end of the day, I think, you know, we're all firefighters, we wanna know not just why am I doing this, but why does this work? Why is this gonna actually give me results? And they did, and they have all the science behind it. They can tell you I, I can't. <laughs> I do it, um, I know some of it, but they can answer probably just about any question you have. And then finally, we started doing it, and we started seeing results. And we started seeing people who were in asystole for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 35 minutes, 40 minutes, and those are the people that we would have left and we would have been back at the station filling out the rest of the paperwork for the coroner, and we're starting to see them get pulses back. We're starting to see them get you know, a stable, um, stable blood pressure. Starting to see them sustain that stable blood pressure all the way to the hospital, and they get to the hospital and they go to the cath lab, and then we have some really good people that do a lot of data collection, and we're starting to see people hear stories about, yeah, that guy walked out. Yeah, that person's in a rehab facility and they're getting better. You know, that person, that guy at Amazon, you remember him? Yeah, he, he's fine. He just saw his grandson be born. And those are some things that I think for everybody are, are some, just some of the basics, is you need to have a culture where, hey, change is okay. I'm a firefighter, but I hate two things. I hate change and I hate the way things are, you know? Um, we hate changing, but we also know that we're not doing it the best. So people need to know they can change and know that they're not gonna get in trouble. People need to have buy-in from, from the people who are asking for the change. We need to know why we're doing what we're doing, and then we need to, to see the results, whether they're good or bad. We need to be real about those, we need to be honest about those, and, and for me, hearing about people that survived 
and walked out of the hospital was big. Because if all we're doing is getting people's heart to start beating and they're in a con home and they have no quality of life or they die two days later, then are we really doing anything? But when we start hearing 20, 30% of people are walking out on their own, out of their own strength, out of the hospital, they're with their families, they're with their kids, or with their grandkids. Those are things that are important. So um, definitely follow up with the hospitals, definitely get data, and definitely understand it's a team effort. So it wouldn't work if only our administration wanted us to do it, and then it wouldn't work if our administration wasn't behind us doing it on the floor. So um, with that all said and done, um, there's a lot to share and not a lot, enough time. So during lunch, afterwards, tomorrow, during all the skills stuff, um, ask us questions, because there's a lot that we have that, that we just can't share up here um, for time reasons. Um, but that's pretty much it. Um, if you try it, I guarantee you, you'll, uh, you'll see some changes. Okay. You can stay up here. So we have a little bit of time before uh, lunch comes in, so we would uh, be happy to field any questions if uh, hopefully most of you are staying with us through tomorrow so you can see an in-depth look at the whole process, a lot more about the science and a lot about the skills. Um, but any questions uh, for, for me, for Jeremiah, for anybody else, sir? So you get all the basics done first, and, and that's, that's great. Um, so after you've got all the basics done, you establish some IV access, and then do you still do have an effort for um, antiarrhythmics for B arrest? Oh, yes. Yeah, so we're on the same medication cycle as anybody else. So uh, epinephrine has first round and, and, uh, and antiarrhythmic has the second round. Um, we don't see a ton of... Um, of uh, recurrent VFib. Um, one of the things that we do is, that you'll learn tomorrow, is we do anterior posterior pad placement. Uh, it is the recommended pad placement from whatever monitor you have, I, it's the recommended pad placement. Changing that vector changed our first shock efficacy threefold. Um, so it, it, it makes a big deal. It's a little harder to do. You do have to sit them up to put that pad on the back, but that's one of the pauses you'll notice in our CPR. Um, but um, we don't have a ton of refractory VFib, but um, we also don't have an ECMO center um, until next year that's going to stand up. So what we do with those true refractory VFib patients is uh, occasionally they get somewhere good. Most of the time they go to the emergency room and get called. Other questions? It's going to take a while for them to lay out that food, so there's got to be more questions. Yes, sir. So with your heads up CPR, do you guys stick everybody on the gurney or do you use like some sort of, did you go to an orthopedist office and figure out, because they're great with angles, right? Did you, did you get some sort of tool from that? <laughs> it's either on the gurney or makeshift on scene. Um, and so we've tried and looked at wedges and a variety of other things and um, none of that is superior to uh, just putting a drug box underneath them and working from there. And we'll show you tomorrow that uh, if you happen to put them on the auto pulse and put a drug box, vertically like this, you can sit on it, their heads up, and you can still innovate in the heads up position, which is by far the easiest way to innovate. You can tell us tomorrow, you can try all of them, all the positions of innovation, but if any of you ever worked in an aircraft, you try never to innovate in the aircraft because you can't change where you sit, not unless you want to get fired and unstrap, and you can't change where the patient sits, but you can innovate them heads up. Um, so it works really, really good. That's how we innovate all patients by preference now. But otherwise, Jeremiah will be, he's uh, very good at making up a new way to, uh, to put them heads up in some hoarder house in the back of, you know, some single wide mobile home. There's, there's always a way. If you can get in there, you can get them heads up. Yes, sir. Sorry if you already covered this. I was a little bit, a little bit late to the new So um, this is a real, a real exciting topic, but could you please cover uh, the process like data collection, analysis, QI processing, ongoing training, that you have, just kind of the back end stuff. So data collection, uh, we do have, uh, uh, we use ImageTrain Elite for uh, EPCR software. Um, we do collect data out of there. We have standardized reports. All the EMS staff get notified of cardiac arrest and, and when uh, cardiac arrest is entered. By and large, we don't use that to drive our um, near real-time QI. We use um, 
the Zolex series monitor that you see in the back of the room and a software on there called Case Review. That's the data that you saw on the slides that shows you every compression, the depth, the rate, everything about ventilations, um, all of those things. That's the biggest thing for us is um, looking at, um, you know, like I said, we don't, we don't care what uh, you documented, we care what actually happened. We're trying to align those two, but um, we want to know about pauses. We want to know about when things were not, didn't go exactly as planned. So that's the biggest part. And then the crews get feedback from our QI coordinator directly um, on those calls. And, and they will, the crews will send a report in after every cardiac arrest saying, this is what happened, this is what we did, this was the outcome. It goes by email, goes to our staff, and you know, we'll send them a, hey, you know, congratulations, great job, and we'll, you know, see that person when they get discharged, or, you know, hey, you did everything right, and it doesn't always work out, or sometimes they get to come to my office, not my office, but somebody else's office, and that's just, tell me a story, tell me why it was different this time, let us, let us learn from that. Um, the training, uh, Jeremiah hit on it, we train a lot on this and many other EMS topics, and we are a busy fire department, high fire combat environment as well, so Jeremiah will run more fires than he will um, cardiac arrest this year. Um, and uh, so there's time constraints to that, but we train quarterly on, on cardiac arrest specifically. Um, it's an ongoing uh, forever challenge, but it's our biggest opportunity to change the destiny of our community. They're still setting up. Two more questions. Come on. Then we'll get more caffeine. Yes, sir. So, sort of combining with the subjects this morning, what, um, very sophisticated resuscitation package when you get your hands on the patient. Um, what has the department done um, about the fact that you get a viable patient in your crew's hand? So that's the, the community component, training them on recognition um, and calling 911. Um, we have a, a diverse community, low socioeconomic, not everyone called 911. They still don't. Um, but we started in, at you know sub 20s on bystander CPR and we're north of 50. Um, now, um, getting people trained, getting youth trained in CPR, it can be, you could do anything. You could uh, throw out um, inflated balloons, have the cheerleaders do it, have the band play uh, Staying Alive um, at the homecoming game and everyone just puts the balloon on the, on the uh, bleachers and they push hard, push fast until they pop the balloon and you just train 2,000 people in CPR. Sounds stupid except for the fact that you will find that when you ask someone that does CPR later, hey, where'd you learn how to do this? They're gonna say, you taught us three months ago. Um, so that's been a big deal. Getting AEDs out there has been a big, big deal for us and then the Pulse Point um, program uh, as a way to track those AEDs and communicate um, with uh, our community superheroes has been a big part of that. But that is ongoing. That's an area that we have to continue to work on, get those numbers much higher. And the, it changes by socioeconomic uh, demographic. There are some subsets of populations where people will not do CPR and we need to, we need to work on those. No. no, no, my guy in the back of the room. So He's just trying to embarrass me. No, no, no. So, uh, so we say AEDs are important, but we delay defibrillation. How do you reconcile those two? So we say AEDs are important, but we delay the defibrillation. So that goes back to the early defibrillation. We don't want to, um, if someone watches somebody go down, does CPR, gets an AED and shock them, survival in our community is what, Joe? 100%. Witness arrest with AED use, by center CPR and AED use is 100%. Small case, small, you know, it's four a year, but it's 100%. So you want that, right? Um, but you don't want to be shocked into asystole and die. So it's just the balancing of early defibrillation versus do no harm. So if we know, we can prove in our data that if we shock fine V-fib, we always shock into asystole and they always die, we don't want to do that. So we're just, we have tools that can tell us that, that can help us, you know. If you can't identify it as V-fib from five feet away and their end tidal CO2 is four, they will not convert into a pulsing rhythm. They will convert into a Sicily or not convert at all. Um, and there's science behind that to research on at what levels they convert, hypoxia, oxygenation, acidosis. It's not perfect and we need to do better in that regard, but that's mostly a we don't want to harm people um, scenario. You guys do early defibrillation. Really dumb, right? But then you get there, guarantee of 10 minutes. From the time they went down, the time they called somebody, the time dispatch got the call, they, they coded the call, they said you out, you got the response time and all 
crap that goes with that. Right here, 10 minutes, 12 minutes into the call, that's not really the fibrillation. That's an acidotic, hypoxic heart that doesn't respond well to the fibrillation. But an AD you use, like Chief said, usually the AD is used in the first minute of cardiac arrest, a few minutes. That's really the fibrillation, and that's beneficial for so to separate those out. He just gave away the test answers for tomorrow morning, so you might want to write those down. There's no test. There is a quiz. Yes, ma'am. Um, I am Mary Louise from the Salem Fire Foundation. Um, have you done any research on uh, why the people don't get into the fire service and why they don't do CPR when people go down? I know, you know, we all anecdotally probably guess, but is there been any community research done so we can create messaging around that? Yeah, there's some um, not unique specifically to our community, but uh, but to our county and to our region. And then there's um, some some much better data, bigger systems. Memphis um, being probably the the best one. Um, but um, uh, there's a combination of in our area of the legal status of the person. Um, so people that are not in the country legally are far more resistant to doing anything that they feel might. Um, put them in an encounter with law enforcement. Um, so that's that's a big component. There are cultures where it is not appropriate for someone to touch somebody else, um, specifically or more often with uh, a man versus a woman. Um, and um, that that's a big challenge. Um, and then a, a big one that you'll need to overcome is this perception that the person you may do harm or the person may still be alive. We see it more in pediatric populations than adult. People are generally willing to put their hands in the middle of the chest, push hard, push fast. In kids, they will default to maybe they're not dead, maybe I won't do CPR. Um, or I think I feel a pulse and then they stop doing CPR for eight minutes until the fire engine gets there pretty much guaranteeing that that kid's not gonna survive. So the default on adults um, is uh, much different than the default on kids as far as people's willingness to put their hands on chest, as dumb as that sounds, that's something that's, that we find. So you, and you can build training around all of that, absolutely. Do you, uh, any other agencies or uh, nationally or internationally that have adopted your cardiac survival So we think the number is 16, although it changes daily, we occasionally get calls from people say, hey, we're doing what you do. Um, but uh, Lawrence Douglas uh, County, Kansas, City County, Kansas, um, was the first place to adopt. Um, Fort Mojave Mesa in Arizona, um, uh, Naperville, Illinois, there's places all throughout the country. Um, we also um, are very similar to what Dr. Shepke, um, the program that he built in Palm Beach County. So we adopted Heads Up CPR and a variety of these other implements that you see here um, right before that they did. So they're following suit with what we're doing. Um, and so you see, um, uh, a number of agencies doing either exactly what we do or very close to what we do um, now. And uh, so uh, EMS providers only, like Hawking County, Ohio, um, fire departments with transport, fire departments without transport, all the way to BLS ambulance with no first responder fire at all, um, finding a way to do exactly what we do. And they do better than we do because they don't have to make the mistake of when do I give epinephrine because they don't have epinephrine. So they never compromise CPR. And are they seeing those same successes you experienced with the 80%? Yeah, so all of them saw successes. Uh, the first one was uh, Lawrence Douglas, and theirs, their successes were better than ours. Um, so we'll just have to see if, if it sustains. So, um, but the thing there is the more numbers, the more cases, the more opportunity to see where the system needs to be corrected and improved because we don't want to reinforce uh, the wrong actions because of luck. Sir? Uh, with the amount of time it takes to train um, and how comprehensive this program is, has there been any other areas of EMS in the program that have suffered or lost focus that you've noticed? Do you want to answer that? Yeah. Um, so initially, it was a lot. So initially, we that was a, a very big focus for our department. So I'd say there's probably, what, maybe three to six months where most of our training was focused on um, this because it is a lot lately it hasn't been because just like anything else it becomes a system so you get used to running the call a certain way Ev once everybody's on board it, it's honestly actually easier um, if you have a mechanical CPR it takes multiple people out of the way 
and it does it consistently every time. Uh, you put them on the gurney, it's easier to innovate. You're not laying on the floor and who knows what. You're not leaning on the floor. You don't have sharps somewhere around that you're worried about getting stuck with. Um, <clears throat> so it, it definitely streamlines a lot of things. I know looking at it, it looks like everything's different. And initially it, it is. And initially there's a lot of focus on what to do, what order, how long. Everybody's trying to remember, hey, how long do we do this? Hey, you know, and, and after a, a little while, not that long, um, it becomes the norm. And then it, unless there's a change or unless they, you know, start researching something else, it just becomes the way you run a cardiac arrest. So there will be a huge initial time investment. Um, but after everybody's on board, after everybody kind of has a system, it, it's, it's pretty easy, easy for everybody. Um, so initially, yes, um, but eventually, no. can't do more with less so something we knew there was gonna be an investment of time and that we would lose some focus on some other areas and that was worth it for a short period of time it was known right so there was things that were gonna stack up and that we'd have to get get to later yeah. sir sure do you find that the discipline and the, and the sort of the way you do things in cardiac arrest trickles down and has a positive effect on the rest of your EMS or fire service type of tasks? I do. I, I, I'll let Jeremiah speak to that. But yes, that's um, we've said for a long time that, uh, you know, we show up on a working structure fire. Um, nobody gets out and says, okay, who's going to pump this thing? Who's going to pull the hose, right? That doesn't happen. Um, but that does happen in some areas of EMS. Um, and cardiac arrest, maybe not the greatest example, but pediatric cardiac arrest, I'm imagining your organization, that someone finds a kid down, they pick them up, they run to the animals, doing nothing with them until they get to the animals, they don't position them, they don't maintain their airway, they do really crappy CPR and they drive as fast as possible to the hospital, almost guaranteeing that that child will die. And that's not an insult, that's what we do too. Um, we're working <coughs> on that, you know, and we're working on traumatic, but the work to get there has been less. The work to get there on other fire disciplines has been less because they, the men and women that work for us, have a process for a process now, right? So it's like, okay, we're, we're going to get here, and we know there's going to be some weird steps along the way, but um, so they can buy into that, and it makes change, it makes change, the ability to change faster. Realizing that we drive a Ferrari, I drive a Ferrari, right? Um, I have five stations, you know. Three shifts, I can see everybody pretty quickly and make changes quick when I'm not driving a, the state of Oregon. That'd be more like, you know, trying to turn a, an oil tanker or something. Um, yeah, so uh, again, we've, we've got a, a good system for cardiac arrest. And, and we don't do everything good or perfect. We got a lot of stuff we're working on. But I think we've been very good, um, especially over the last few years, uh, years of building flexible systems, whether it's a, a, a structure fire, uh, how you size it up, how you work it, how you work a uh, cardiac arrest. Uh, one of the advantages we do have though is we have our own ambulances. So we work with the same crews every day. So I know when I go to work, I'm gonna have the same captain, I'm gonna have the same firefighter, and on the ambulance I'm gonna have um, the same paramedic and the same EMT. So we can make that, I think, change a little bit easier because we're seeing the same faces every time. And because I know, you know, this paramedic's a great airway medic and this guy's great cardiology and we're gonna work together. Hey, you look at the, you know, you work the monitor, you do the airway, um, you are good with people, so you talk to the family. Um, but we've done a good job of, of kind of building some systems that are very flexible so that when we start doing something new, we're not building a new program every time. We're kind of fitting stuff into um, some, some generalized systems that, that are flexible. So I think we're, we'll take uh, last question and, and break for lunch, and, but we're obviously available for today and tomorrow. Answer questions anytime. We'll give you all of our contact information so you can email us 
I'll give you my cell phone number, call anytime. Joe calls me in the middle of the night anyway, so it's all right. Yes, ma'am. From start to finish implementing the toolbox, what was the timeline for your system to be proficient at this? Um, so I would say that it is will always be a work in progress. Um, so we have, within about six months, we had about 90% compliance with the use of the toolbox. Does that, does that make sense? It, it was a process. I don't, want, I don't want you guys to look at it and go, hey, we're going to just drop, drop the toolbox in there. It's all going to be work and it's no. going to work great. It, it was, it's, it's, year, it's been a years of, of, of that process. It's been years of learning, years of QI, years of, hey, come back in. Let's talk about this again because it's the fourth time I'm talking about not using the rescue pod, not doing heads up, right? And we're in that process. And it, we're, not, we're not there yet. We're not 100% quiet now, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's always going to be a process for us. But you can cut that period much shorter if you adopted what we do or what somebody else does and say hey that's what Lawrence did that's what other places have done they just took it as a program brand new and say we're gonna do these people are from another zip code so they must know what they're talking about you know you can't be a prophet in your own town so to speak but um, so you take a new program from somebody else and you adopt it and it goes much faster because the change is not an internal change it's it's an external locus and it, it allows you to leapfrog a lot of those challenges and gain compliance much quicker all right, Chief Mimosa. Please, not adding much. Go eat lunch. <laughs> <laughs>